a series on game is you win at the counterpart's expense or the counterpart win at your expense. The alternative to that is partnership. And the real form of partnership is where both parties do have an interest in obviously walking away from the negotiation table with a, with a win, but not necessarily at the, at the expense of the counterpart. Um, but quite often in partnership, people are missing the, the role of engagement, as we call it. They haven't negotiate on how to negotiate. They're often missing uh, verbalizing trust. You're listening to the Sales Today podcast, and I'm your host, Fred Copestake. On this podcast, we explore how sales professionals can develop a modern approach to winning business, the application of virtual selling techniques, how to create meaningful business relationships, and much more. Why not take our free collaborative selling scorecard to see how your sales approach suits today's environment? You'll find a link in the show notes. And welcome to this episode of the Sales Today podcast, where I'm delighted to be joined by Keld Jensen. Keld is a guy who is passionate about negotiation. Uh, I asked him why just before we, we started hitting record, and he says, well, it's all about getting people better at collaborating. And we had this little conversation. I thought, yes, I'm absolutely right to have him on the podcast, uh, particularly because he's got this concept of smartnership. And that's why I really want to understand what's that all about. So, Keld, welcome to the Sales Today podcast. Thank you for having me, Fred. Delighted to have you with us. And, and like I say, I mean, the first question is so easy. Smartnership. <laughs> what is it? Tell us all about it. Yeah, well, how much time have we got? Because, uh, you know, I can spend hours and hours and hours on it. But let's let's do the, the short version. Smartnership is really just partnership version 2.0. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is because I've spent ages in the world of negotiation, collaborations, and what have you. And uh, I actually discovered, Fred, that so many organizations are using the word partnership, um, and they're using it wrong because they're saying, you know, we're in partnership with our suppliers, and we're in partnership with our clients. And 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 what they are in reality is they're in, in long-term zero-sum. You know, they are basically in a very positional game, uh, but they've been doing it for six years, and then they think they are in a partnership. So um, some years ago, we sat down and uh, identified the choice of strategies you have in collaboration, in negotiation. And uh, we basically put three headlines on it. One is zero sum. And I assume that your listeners know what a zero sum game is. You win at the counterpart's expense or the counterpart win at your expense. The alternative to that is partnership. And the real form of partnership is where both parties do have an interest in obviously walking away from the negotiation table with uh, with a win, but not necessarily at the, at the expense of the counterpart. Um, but quite often in partnership, people are missing the, the role of engagement, as we call it. They haven't negotiated on how to negotiate. They're often missing a verbalizing trust, and they haven't actually discussed the variables and, and necroeconomics, another term that I'm sure we'll get back to in a couple of minutes. So we kind of elevated negotiation into what we call smartnership, where we, um, in order to be successful, need to address how we want to negotiate. We need to verbalize um, the trust. We need to write down how we want to agree on, on negotiating. And, and the reason I'm saying that we need to negotiate on how to negotiate is because I don't know, Fred, whether you ever thought about it, but United Nations in New York has never ever decided how we're going to negotiate. So you could be perceiving the uh, negotiation like playing tennis, and I could be perceiving uh, negotiation like playing chess. You know, so if you and I meet up, it was going to be a funny game, isn't it? Because you're walking into the room with a racket, and I'm sitting there moving my chess pieces around, um, and then we're trying to negotiate. So one of the things that is covered within partnership is we need to negotiate on how to negotiate. We need to agree on what negotiation is all about. Then we need to talk about transparency. We need to agree on the variables, what is the, what is uh, negotiable, and so on and so forth. So the short version, and that was really your answer, uh, your, your question, the answer to your question, Fred, is really smartnership is version 2.0 of partnership. So it's just changing the mindset of what negotiation is all about. Oh, I love that. Negotiate, how to negotiate. Oh, that's going to be my little, little catchphrase, I think. Um, uh, yeah, and when you say partnership, I think it's even worse than you might have said. That some people, well, honestly, they'll call somebody a partner. Right. Have no intention of partnering with them. It's just it's a nice right. little label to keep them sweet, and I it agree. means you can then take advantage of them because we pull out the p word. 
every exactly. time we want them to do something. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, so far yeah. away from what you've said. <laughs> I, I I had a scary experience. I think it was just last week. I had a client who sent me um, a copy of a letter they received from procurement from one of their big clients. It's a major uh, global company. You would know it if I mentioned the name. And procurement department of that organization sent out a letter saying, we want to maintain and emphasize the strong partnership we have with you as a supplier. So we want a 10% price reduction uh, with, 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 from, from, from right now. That, that was the content of the letter. And I didn't know whether I should laugh or cry, right? Because you had the word partnership in the same letter as we want a 10% price reduction. Um, you know, so there, there you go. That explains why partnership is not really a word people understand. <laughs> and, well, I don't, not understand, or maybe they just are a bit cynical of it almost in a partnership. Yeah, well, you would say that because it's for right. your good. Um, right. And so what you're saying is, well, it can be for good. Let's hmm. take it seriously. <laughs> and here is a way to ta- start taking it seriously. Right. Um, exactly. And that, that's the partnership way of, of operating. Right. Again, right. very close to my heart because I right. write about partnering skills. So, yeah, yeah. we're on the on the same the same wavelength here. Mm. So how do I go about setting this up? You know, how can I start to build a partnership if I want to do that? Well, if it was extremely easy, I think everybody would be doing it immediately because it, it makes so much sense. I mean, it, it's it's going to increase the profit line of your organization, but not at the expense of the counterpart. And you're even helping the counterpart to be more profitable. And you know, the funny part is, Fred, sometimes I meet organizations that come to me and say, why would we care? if the counterpart makes money or not. And, and I say, why wouldn't you? Because if the counterpart is, 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 is successful, it will help your organization as well. I actually have a client who have a, he, he has what I would call the perfect quote. He says, it's so complicated doing business with somebody who doesn't make money. And I love that quote because think about it this way. If you have a supplier who is struggling and you call them to get help, it is, it, is, it is not going to be easy to get help, is it? Because they don't have the resources to do anything for you. On the other hand, if you have a supplier who is very profitable and very successful in what, they, in what they're doing and you call them, uh, you know, they, 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 can, they, they can do anything and everything to help you because they have the resources. So quite often, Fred, I know I'm just going a little bit off topic from your question right now, but quite often we advise our clients to start off negotiation by saying to the counterpart, I'm not kidding. We actually tell them to, to say the following. I'm here today, Fred, to help you reduce your risk, reduce your liabilities, and help you improve your profit. That's why I'm here. Would you be interested in me helping you doing that? Now, I can promise you, Fred, that most counterparts that are going to uh, meet that approach are going to look a little bit suspicious, but they, they will eventually say yes, because why wouldn't you? And when you get the counterpart's acceptance to that, then you have to move on by saying, and by the way, um, I do feel that your role today should be helping me reducing my costs, reducing my risk and helping me improving my profit. So our common goal today is reducing cost liabilities and risk and help each other be more profitable. That's why we're here. So back to your, your, your question, smartnership and how we should implement it is, is basically about changing a mindset. It's not only a toolbox with tools, how we can make the horse and bucky run faster. We should actually invent the car instead because it's all about changing on how we perceive collaboration, how we perceive negotiation, how we perceive sales. It's really a group exercise where we're sitting together to help each other out becoming more successful. And I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not talking about it this way just because it, has, it should sound like a, 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 you know, a nice Disney fairy tale. Um, it's actually serious business because we are going to be more profitable by changing a mindset. So <clears throat> back to your original question, it's actually complicated to implement because you know, uh, you probably know the term water run downwards, right? So we have to start at the top. It really, we need to change the KPIs in organizations. So if you're sitting with a procurement officer who's purely measured on the lowest price he or she can get, um, it's going to fail big time. So you have to change the setup, the, the measuring tools, the KPIs, um, because suddenly you have to be measured on total cost of ownership. You have to be measured on, on perhaps the price goes up, but your total cost of ownership goes down. Um, so it is really changing how we perceive negotiations. So I see it um, implemented very successful in some organization, and I've seen it fail uh, tremendously in other organizations, because as I said, it requires that the top, that the executive level understand what it is we are, we're trying to do. It, I don't know if this is a fair, fair way to paraphrase this, but it sounds a little bit like it's being a good customer. Is that is that fair? 
yeah, 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 you could say Be- that. Because when you say you know, it's about reducing, uh, reducing costs, reducing risk, increasing your profit, salespeople are pretty good at spotting that and talking about that and, and selling that's what we do. And I can imagine customers sitting there thinking, yeah, yeah, that's exactly. But you would help me do that. And I can I can actually imagine some just in their heads going, no, that's not what we're here for. I'm here for you to do these things for me. Yeah. And we immediately get imbalanced, don't we? Right. <laughs> and like, right. oh, that's right. gonna be tough to partner properly then, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And 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 I think from from buy side, what they often not often, that, that's unfair to use the word often, but what they sometimes misunderstand is that um they might put a cost on the supplier that is higher than their benefit, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. For instance, uh, let me give you a very quick example. If we look at terms of payment, cost of capital, every organization have a cost of capital. Money costs money, right? It's a commodity like a table, a desk, a lamp, whatever. It's a commodity. You can buy and sell money. That's basically what banks make, make a living out of. So let's assume, Fred, that you are the buyer and you come to me and say, Kel, if you want you, if, if, if I want you to supply to us I want a, a credit line of 90 days. That's it. Take it or leave it. Now, let's assume that my cost of capital is 8% and your cost of capital is 3%. Then it doesn't really make sense because your cost of capital is way lower than mine and you're forcing me into giving you a long line of credit. Instead, you should pay me upfront or at delivery. And by doing that, I could, I could give you a discount of, let's say, up to 7% or 6% because my cost of capital was 8 and if I actually give you a discount of, let's say, 6% and your cost of capital was 3 you would still have utilized 3% additional profit margin by doing that. You know, And this is what we call in economics the asymmetric value between your cost and my benefit or my cost and your benefit. So a lot of procurement departments are really sorry to use the, the term screwing up because they're just putting demands out there to the supplier, not knowing what their cost or risk or liability might be by enforcing that that demand. And if, if, as I keep saying, if the, if the cost to the counterpart is higher than your benefit, you don't want to go along with it because basically you're losing as well. So back to that letter from, from, from that major client to, um, from, from my client, the one that just demanded 10% price reduction. Uh, on top of that, they also demanded 90 days line of credit. Instead of doing that, they should reach out to the supplier and say, listen, we want to optimize our total cost of ownership. Could we renegotiate some of the variables we have in, in the agreement. Because perhaps we're figuring out that, no, our cost of capital is lower than yours. Perhaps we could figure out that it's easier for us picking up the new delivery. Perhaps we could figure out that this and that and that. And, and we actually created a list of more than 340 variables, Fred, where we could identify asymmetric value, the difference between the two parties. But in order to do that, you have to work in smartnership because you have to be transparent, you have to be open, you have to be honest. And you have to agree on, on role of engagement. You have to agree on how are we going to split that potential benefit that we're going to, to create. Transparent, open, honest, and agree on the way we're going to do it. Mm-hmm. I love that. So going back, and you said it earlier, that partly this is because people have kind of measured on the wrong things. If I measured on, I measured on 90 days, get it up to 95, yeah. get it up to 100, get it to 120. Oh, you've done a good job, Fred. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I've done a good job really putting my cus- my supplier in a bad position. Mm-hmm. But is it also about the thinking and kind of how we naturally, I suppose, I don't know if it's natural, you'll tell me, kind of perceive those discussions to be and that, you know, that's, you're coming here and I have to press you, I have to push you, I have to take these things away. I have to win. Hmm. Is, is that what's hampering us a bit, a bit, do you think? I actually saw a wonderful um, blog post the other day on LinkedIn. It was a, a, a procurement officer who said, when I was in my 20s, being a young procurement officer, all I was focused on was winning the negotiation with the supplier. It was all about getting my terms. It was all about leaving the table feeling I was a winner. Uh, now I'm in my 40s and I completely... Uh, revise that approach. Now I'm looking at how can we mutually win? How can I help the supplier actually reduce their costs in order to help me become more uh, profitable? And I actually love that blog post, partly because it was honest. And and secondly, because I think that's kind of the development that we are seeing. Um, I, I think it's not only uh, about the individual, it's also about generational changes. If I look at what I would call old school procurement officers, 
and I don't want to offend anybody, but, you know, typically men in their 50s or 60s, you know, they are the one leaning back behind the desk, putting the, uh, the legs on the table and then saying to the supplier, well, give me your best shot. You only have one, right? And, and they don't see the benefit of collaboration, opening up, assisting or helping the supplier. Um, thank God, when I look at perhaps better uh, educated younger individuals, they typically arrive, uh, and I'm generalizing, but typically arrive with a different understanding and not the same combative behavior uh, or competitive behavior, because there's a lot of there, there's a lot of competitive psychology in this, Fred. It's it's very often about you know I'm the procurement officer, I should be in charge, I I, I want to win. It's 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 quite often that um, that it's it's all about. Or as we talked about before, that's what you're measured on, because can we all agree that we are doing what we're being measured on, right? So if a procurement officer is being measured on, as you said, um, getting 120 days instead of 90, well, that is what he or she will be looking for because that's how he or she is being measured. If he or she was being measured on creating um, necroeconomics and TCO, that is probably what they, what they would be doing. So back to what I said earlier, Fred, it's really about changing the mindset in uh, the organization as a whole. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I talk about partnering skills, I mean, you've kind of listed out some of the, the, the key elements for it. I looked at what Steve Dent writes about, and, and one of the key areas for him is being comfortable with interdependence. Mm-hmm. And, and I just think the easiest way to translate that, how I translate it to salespeople is, your success is my success. Mm-hmm. That's how a salesperson should think. Make the customer successful, you're successful as a result. Mm-hmm. And of course, it takes two to tango. <laughs> it's hard to do that if someone isn't playing that same game, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but when we do, what a great place. We can mm-hmm. start having really collaborative properly collaborative and creative discussions about how we can do it around those 340 variables did you say mm-hmm. 340 340 wow. yeah and, and 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 the fun part about variables when 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 we look at it quite often most organizations i, I would basically say all organizations are negotiating on too few variables um i was sitting with a client um, about six months ago and we were looking into doing a brainstorming on the variables they had accepted, uh, available. This was a client in the energy sector and um, they were doing major deals. You know, we were talking hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and they were negotiating on nine commercial variables. So it could be, you know, price, delivery time, warranty, installation, blah, 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 what have you. And so they were negotiating on nine commercial variables. We did brainstorming exercise for just a day, a little bit less than a day. And they came up with 76 variables. Um, implemented uh, 29 of those and improved their profit immediately in the ne- next negotiated contract by 8%. Um, so just by expanding the number of variables, you can quite often improve your, your, your profit because if you start negotiating on more variables, um, well, you just expand the pie in general. And what we're talking about and what we have found through our studies of more than 35,000 negotiations, Brad, is that you're actually able to increase the value with up to 42%. um, And I repeat 42% um, by embracing the concept of necroeconomics and smartnership. Um, And and including that is obviously just, and I'm saying just is not that easy, but expanding number of variables that you negotiate on. I'm sure most of your listeners um, listening to this podcast here, um, most of them are without any doubt negotiating on too few variables. And I'm probably sure some of, some of them are sitting out there thinking right now, I don't know what he's talking about because we're negotiating on everything we can. Um, and quite often we think we are because we've been in the industry for a long, long time. Um, I've been in, in, in this business for 20 years and, and I know what I'm doing, but quite often we need inspiration from the outside. And they don't need to call somebody like you and me. They can actually just go to a friend in a completely different uh, industry and invite that friend to come in and take a look at their variables. And and that guy will probably say, why don't you negotiate that thing as well? Or why don't you negotiate that thing? Because, you know, what what is typical to negotiate in one industry is completely uh, alien to, to, to another. So just get inspiration from other industries can actually help you expand that list of variables quite a lot. Yeah, I, I hope people listening to this just take that piece of advice to sit down, start listing out those variables, challenging themselves to see whether even just splitting a variable into can that actually be defined in different ways mm. and then go and talk to somebody else, different industry. Mm. Um, uh, how, how many times have you heard people say, yeah, but not in my industry? 
we don't do that. <laughs> well, it, 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 nearly as well as me by that laugh. <laughs> yeah, if I got a dollar every time I heard that, Fred, I, I, I'll be doing quite well. Um, yes, no, that's that's a typical phrase. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and that's the point. Go to someone who's not in your industry, and you will learn something from them. It's, yes, uh, yes, exactly. It's crazy. Um, mm. Okay, so having a look at the variables, what else might people be able to do sort of from a practical point of view to just get their head around just start to, to, to push this mindset you know tweak the mindset a little bit to get closer mm, uh, to being smart yeah it's 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 really about exercising because it, the, the concept is so simple so it sometimes becomes complicated if you know what i mean it, it is really simple uh, there's no rocket science in it but what, what what is often hard is is actually changing the way that we conduct business isn't it um, changing our habits. So this is about changing a habit. And I, quite often I'm doing the exercise, it's a stupid little exercise where I ask my clients or students to cross their arms like this. And obviously those of you listening can't see me do it, but just cross your arms. And then I ask them to do it opposite. You know, So if you're normally doing it this way, then I ask them to do it the, the other way around. And people find that awkward. And I'm normally just expressing that, well, it's the same thing, changing a habit. It feels awkward in the beginning. But if you kept doing this the opposite way of crossing your arms, if you do that on, on purposely for the next three weeks and we will meet up again, then it would be normal for you to do it the other way around. So what we really need to understand is that we are um, we are caught up in habits and, and the way we negotiate is all about habits, traditions, how we always have been doing it. So in order to change that, uh, it's actually very dramatical in the beginning and it might even feel really awkward and strange, uh, but it's something we have to work on. So. It's not enough to read a book about it. I actually saw another blog post the other day I thought was wonderful. It, it, it actually stated, how come there are so many great books on negotiation out there, but we're not really negotiating in, in, any better than we did you know, 40 years ago? And I love that blog post because it's so true. I mean, I have met, I don't know how many people who obviously read Getting to Yes, the first real book on collaboration that was ever out there from, from Harvard University, Professor Yuri. Uh, it's one of the best-selling book on negotiation ever. Been selling millions and millions and millions of copies, and still, I meet people today who've been reading it probably even several times and understood nothing of of what was in that book. You know, they read the book, thought this is a cool book on negotiation, went straight back into zero sum. Um, so, reading a book is not enough. Um, listening to this podcast is is not enough. It's only inspiration for you to start working on changing your habits. Um, and obviously, we can't do that. We can only uh, try and inspire people to do something, but you need really seriously need to want to change that, and then you need to exercise and and work on it. Um, so that again, I'm not sitting and saying uh, that is impossible and it's too hard, but the benefit of changing those habits are remarkable. And we have loads and loads of business cases of people who actually change their approach into negotiation, change their approach into collaborating with with suppliers and. Uh, and and uh, and bias and and what we've seen is just the the amount of benefit coming out of that from a profit point of view is just incredible. So it's it's absolutely worthwhile, but requires an investment from you as an individual. Does that translate as if you want a six pack, you've got to do the sit ups? <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. I, I I've I've been trying everything in the world to avoid that, and and I have not succeeded yet. So yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> You've thought about going to the gym every single day for the last two years, but they haven't materialized. Fancy yeah, that. yeah, yeah. You, you are spot on, Fred. You are absolutely spot on right there. It's really hard going to the gym. It's annoying. You you you, you sweat and it's, oh, it's hard work, right? Isn't it? Unless we've got a good coffee machine. <laughs> no, but no, but it's it. true. I think when you say about these little books, podcasts, that kind of thing, I mean, it, it's great that people are doing something. It's got to be better than nothing. Mm -hmm. but and I was, I was trying to understand this and kind of what was going on in the head and, and someone's trying to explain it to me that it, it there's a dopamine hit because you've learned something new or that you like it's the anticipation of doing something different that's what gives the reward or, or something like this but you don't actually do it and so you kind of kid yourself that you're doing all this wonderful stuff and you're feeling great for it i've read this book and this book and you're not linkedin's like in december 52 books i read this year mm. but what are you actually doing with it you know, and so it's take that and then do something, isn't it? That's what we're trying to say. Oh, yes, yes, uh, yeah. absolutely. And and there's only a few steps that you need to take. And there's only a few steps that you need to implement in order to see the benefit of changing your your mindset on negotiation. But but back to my crossing the arms, it's about changing that habits. And that's that's the tough part. So in the first couple of weeks or perhaps in the first couple of months, 
it is something that you have to be really aware of. And uh, I, I'm a big fan of checklists. Um, we always produce checklists to our clients and students because in the beginning, you really have to follow that checklist. Um, but let, let, let me just take a big step back for, for a second and talk about my, my own background because I was what, in negotiation, I was what I would call unconsciously incompetent, uh, which is a lovely role to be in because you don't know you can't do it. Um, I was I was the CEO of a public technology company in Stockholm, and I, it was a major company, and I was I was heading it, and I thought I was a great negotiator because when you're heading a company, you have a tendency to feel that you're a great negotiator. And then what happened back in the uh, late eight, uh, 90s was that my former partner came to me. We hired him as a, as a negotiation consultant, and in 120 minutes, he moved me from unconsciously incompetent to consciously incompetent, which was a terrible wake up call because suddenly I realized shoot, I have no clue on how to negotiate because I've just been doing it the way I was I was thinking you were supposed to do it and looking at other people and, you know, never actually took any formal training or education in, in negotiation. So that made me realize that I, I need to do something about it. And that really started my whole mission where I can see that we can improve the way we negotiate tremendously. Um, so what we need to be, obviously, at least is being consciously uh, conscious about the ability to negotiate. And if we want to be really great at it, we obviously have to be unconsciously competent. That means we're doing it without thinking about it. And unfortunately, Fred, there are too many people out there who are unconsciously incompetent. And uh, now I bet you most of those people are not even listening to your podcast right now because they don't see the need um, because I'm great at what I'm doing. So why should I listen to Fred? Uh, why should I read a book on anything? Because I know I'm a great at it. So unfortunately, we're not even reaching those people. We might be reaching those people that are consciously incompetent. So thank you for listening, because this is really worthwhile. And you're the one that's going to make a major leap compared to the unconsciously incompetent people. Um, so it, it's really understand that that growth process that we need to understand that we may not be as good as we, we think we might be. And we need to understand we can actually improve quite a lot. I wonder also whether there might be people listening who are probably sat there nodding thinking yeah well this is all very good this is amusing guys yeah i'm conscious i'm unconsciously competent here but if we had a little bit more time and effort and could probe we might find that they have dropped into bad habits that what's come naturally and they've been very good at has actually now resulted them in kind of going full circle and back to becoming unconsciously incompetent because they've stopped doing some of the things Yes. They always used to use a checklist. They always used to spend twice as much time preparing. They always used to do these things because mm. they're pretty good at it. I don't need the checklist anymore. I, I don't need to prepare because I know how it's going to go. Oh, yeah. Whoa, you're back to being bad and you don't realize it. Right. You're absolutely right, Fred. And 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 one thing I've I've been thinking about is that uh, you, you know you know, when 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 you board an aircraft, right, and and the door to to the flight deck is open. Um, I'm doing quite a bit of flying and. I'm always looking in there if, if it's possible. And I don't know if you noticed that, Fred, but the pilots are sitting out there with the checklist. Yeah. And I've often been thinking, is that because it's the first time ever they're going to fly that aircraft? They've never done it before. So they need to go through the checklist to figure out how do, how do we turn this thing on? Or, or is it because the airline industry have figured out that if we don't use checklists, we might crash the plane? Now, I think it's, it's, it's the latter. I actually think those pilots out there have probably been flying thousands of times before but the airline industry knows that you and I as human beings, we forget. And if a pilot forget to push a button, um, we might have 140 people who die, right? If a salesperson or a negotiator forget to push a button, you might be losing $2, $2 million, right? Um, so unfortunately, it's not human life most of the time, but it's still very dramatic and very sad. Um, so checklist, checklist, checklist. I can only repeat that over and over again. And I've been doing this since 1998. I'm still... In every single negotiation I get into on behalf of a client, going through my own checklist, because I know I will forget stuff if I don't use those checklists. So I can only repeat the uh, the importance of checklist. I love checklists as well. Maybe a slightly different reason. I'm a bit lazy. That's a real reason. Call. We're, 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 we're about being transparent here. You called it. <laughs> no, but why reinvent the wheel every time? Why try to work out all the good stuff you've got to do in something that is pretty complex and there's lots to remember and lots to think about? Hmm. Go through the checklist of that stuff to almost hmm. like free up the brain space to hmm. concentrate on the thing you've got to be thinking about at that time. You know, what are they saying? What are they doing? How am I going to actually go about this this time? What's my right language to get that point across that we've got to negotiate the negotiation? 
Mm. So yeah, that's why that's why I love them as much as anything. Oh yeah, mm. yeah, very important. Um, cool. So it sounds then as though the people that you're going to be negotiating with, there has to be an element of trust in this. I mean, we talked about transparency. We talked about the honesty. Mm -hmm. Can this work without trust, or is it just no? It, don't even try. Um, my immediate answer would be no. It doesn't really work without a certain level of trust. Um, because if you don't have trust, you can't create transparency. If you can't create transparency, you're not going to exchange data and information. Um, so it requires a certain level of trust. Um, now, we shouldn't be confused because obviously um, it's not recommended to become naive either. So, you know, the other side of trust or openness is, is being naive. That's not what I'm saying, because quite often if negotiators becomes too open, they become naive. And that means they quite often move into what I call uh, being very um, concession orientated. You know, they're giving stuff away that they perhaps shouldn't do. But trust is necessary. So, for instance, um, opening a negotiation, um, creating an agenda, uh, we always recommend that trust is part of the agenda. So you have an item on the agenda saying trust. And I meet some people, Fred, which is kind of interesting, who feels it's a little bit of a, of a taboo to talk about trust, verbalize trust. And, and obviously, I could challenge your listeners right now saying, do you feel that you could talk about trust out in the open? So opening up a negotiation, a meeting by saying we would like to discuss trust. So what happens if trust is declining during this negotiation? Are we allowed to, to um, verbalize that and talk about it? And how can you and I work together to increase trust? Because trust is really fundamentally important. Um, I'm quite often doing a, um, a study with my students and, and classes, actually a, a very serious study we did in, in, in laboratory at my business school. Um, where we simply quite often, I just use um, a, a glass, a simple glass, you know, and I hold up two identical glasses in front of my audi or, uh, audience. And I'm saying, Fred, you know what? You are the buyer and you've been buying this glass from this supplier for many, many years. You're very happy with this supplier. Um, you're happy with the quality, the product, the glass and, and everything. And you have a very good relationship and, and you like that, that supplier. Um, your challenge right now, Fred, is a new supplier has arrived on the market and uh, this new supplier is offering the exact same glass, you know, and you're buying millions and millions of glass every year. I don't know why, but you are. Um, but this new supplier is offering the exact same product. No difference whatsoever. However, Fred, this new supplier, every time you meet with that individual, you get a stomach sensation, a gut feeling that something is wrong. You can't really put your finger on it. You don't really like the guy. You don't really trust the guy. You don't really have the same sense of humor. You, you, know, you, you, you know what happens. Sometimes we just meet some people that we are not compatible with, right? But here comes the challenge, Fred. The new supplier is 1% cheaper than the old one that you trust and you like and you've been working with for years. Um, which of these suppliers are you now going to pick? Now, Fred, I can tell you that 95% of all people that I have been doing this with, and this is thousands and thousands and thousands of people, will pick the, assist, the, the existing one, even though he is 1% more expensive. Then I increase the price difference to 3%. They still stick with the existing one. Then I go to 5%, still go with, with, with the existing one. Moving to 7 percent the first one starts saying ah i will probably go with the new one then and sometimes i can go all the way up to 15 or 16 percent before all of them says now i go with the new one even though i don't like and trust him do you know what we did right there fred we just put a price on trust didn't we yeah. because we will accept working with somebody that we don't like and we don't trust if the price difference is up to 15 percent on a very simple product like a glass we're not talking about anything advanced right now it's a stupid, simple product like a glass. And what we discovered in our studies is that if we're talking about more complicated product, the price difference could be up to 38%. So we are accepting a price difference of up to 38% of a more complex, complicated product just based on likability and trust. And the fun thing is, Fred, quite often we're not even aware of it. You know, um, the famous American Israeli professor, Professor Kahneman, that I'm sure most of your listeners will know of, um, if you haven't, please go and, and read his books. He's the father of what we call behavioral economics. So, you know, the marriage between traditional economics and psychology. He won the Nobel Prize in economics, by the way. He has actually been saying that we will always prefer to do business with somebody we like and trust that has the, uh, the worst product at the highest price. 
then we would do business with somebody we don't like and don't trust that has the most competitive product at the lowest price. And, and obviously it's not black and white. As I said, there's a price limit, how much we will pay in addition, but it's just fun to do the exercise because we can actually capitalize trust. So I've renamed trust into trust currency. I just took the two words, trust and currency, and put them together because trust is a monetary value in a negotiation. It was a long answer to your question, Fred, but we really have to understand how important trust is. No, trust is a huge, huge topic. You know, we, we could do a whole podcast Oh, yeah. series of series of podcasts on trust and <laughs> you know th th this idea that you do trust the people rather than build trust with them and how can we build trust oh all, all those all those good things right um oh wow this this is so cool um smart ships i mean they they seriously sound like like the way forward um as we start to wrap up i could talk about this <laughs> forever almost but as we start to wrap up wrap up is there anything else really important that we need to be thinking about and we can sort of take away and, and, and just start to to consider immediately well one recommendation i would i would um i would give is that any organization individual really have to think about um the golden rule uh, I, I don't know if you remember the golden rule. I'm sure at one point in your life, you stumble upon the Bible. Most people have. And whether you're religious or Christian or not, it's not really important. But we have the golden rule, what is called the golden rule. And I'm sure most people actually um, remember the golden rule when I quote it right now. All the do to others what you like others do to you. Now, I'm not especially religious myself or especially Christian, but I actually love that rule. You know, all the do to others what you like others to do to you, right? And you know, what is funny, Fred, and let, let me share this as well. When you start implementing that in negotiation, you're actually going to be more successful. Um, again, we've been starting negotiators who admitted, again, they don't have to be Christian or religious, but if they actually behaved according to, to that rule, we could clearly measure that they were more successful than negotiators who stepped into negotiation and purely negotiated based on their own egocentric uh, values and interest and purpose. Um, so one piece of advice I would give away is uh, try and listen to the golden rule. Ask yourself, that demand requests that I'm putting forward to the counterpart right now, would I be okay if the counterpart was asking that from me, right? Um, and if that's the case, go ahead. And if you feel no, I mean, the counterpart would be a son of a bitch if he asked me to do that. Well, perhaps you shouldn't ask that of the counterpart then. Um, because that's one way of actually embracing smartness as well. You know, you should only do something that is, is good for, for both of you. Now, I, I do have um, another piece of advice I would, I'd like to give you, and that is, the famous American professor, Dr. Nash, um, uh, some of you might know him. He won a Nobel Prize in economics as well. Um, he's the father of game theory. And he was um, an, a very bright individual, you know, one of those who was so intelligent that they're almost up there being completely insane as well. But he was up there. Hollywood even produced a movie about him where Russell Crowe play, plays the role of uh, Dr. Nash. And, um, and, and he was quite fascinating because his approach to all of this was that he was actually criticizing Adam Smith back from 1776. And Adam Smith wrote the book, obviously, The Wealth of Nations, that is the capitalistic Bible, so, so to speak. And Dr. Nash criticized it because Adam Smith is saying that everybody should do what is best for themselves. You know, that is pure capitalism. Where Dr. Nash stepped in and said, that is all wrong. We can only win if we're doing what's good for the counterpart and ourselves at the same time. That's the only true way of creating success. And this is basically the foundation of smartness as well. So this always be became a little bit uh, spiritual at the end here, Fred, but it's all about thinking about, you know, how can we create a common good? Because a common good is good for myself as well. Um, and I can actually just wrap up by, by quoting, I was sitting with a procurement director of a major uh, retail chain recently, and I, I'm not even kidding. He, he told me the following. He said, if our supplier have made any money we haven't been good enough at the negotiation table. That was his, his honest quote, and he was serious about it. And then I said, but you know what? You, have, you are so dominant in your market. You almost got monopoly in certain areas. So if your supplier, who is very dependent on you, is not making a profit, they're, they're going to go bankrupt. And do you know what he said then, Brad? He said, I don't care. Then we find another one. I mean, if you have that approach to the market, um, we will all die. I mean, you know, because, and he will die too, eventually, because he will run out of, of, of supplier. Or even worse, he will he will eliminate all supplier except one, and then that supplier will have monopoly. And then, you know, 
uh, the table have turned. So um, it's it's one sided, stupid, unintelligent approach to the market. You should back to what we talked about. You should have a focus on the counterpart being successful as well. Love it. Oh, I love it. Kel, thank you so much. Um, I think you win a prize for being the podcast guest that's talked about most Nobel Prize winners in half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like you've elevated the whole Sales Today podcast as a result. Um, <laughs> you certainly have in, in some of the stuff that you're sharing. It's, it, it's awesome. I love it. It's, it's absolutely what I believe too. So uh, where can people get in touch with you? Well, I have a new book coming out uh, this October from McGraw Hill called Negotiation Essentials. Um, not because I wrote it, but I would definitely, if people have an interest in this field, I would definitely recommend they take a look into that. Um, I do have a YouTube channel where you can absolutely free um, go and, and watch a bunch of videos about the whole concept I'm talking about. Uh, and we do have online training as well called smartnershipclass.com where people can sign up and, and buy access in, into this training and then I got a series of other books out. Amazon.com got most of them. Uh, and my own website, keljensen.com, explains a lot of what I'm doing as well. So, yeah, there's um, there's a multitude of, of different approaches into what I'm doing. Brilliant. We can drop a link to those. Uh, not every single book. It'll be too long. It'll, it'll crash Spotify. Um, but we'll put a link to, uh, to the YouTube, to the training, and to, to your own to your personal site in the, in the show notes. Great. Thank you so much for coming on. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Sale Today podcast with me, your host, Fred Copestake. I hope you've enjoyed what you heard today. If you did, please get in touch and hit subscribe. And remember, you can take the Collaborative Selling Scorecard for free to check out how your sales approach works in today's environment. You'll find it in the show notes. <laughs>